Um, so, Jason from NASA. Thanks, Steve. Um, at least I'm smart enough to not rely on the wireless network during my demo. Uh, so we have a pretty large Lustre installation at NASA Ames. There's about 12,000 clients uh, accessing about 7 petabytes of uh, formatted space on Lustre. But no matter what the size of your Lustre install, it's important to have actual performance and troubleshooting data. And uh, we think it's important to also have that at interactive speeds, especially if you're doing some uh, visualization of the data or you're interested in looking at uh, trends that might be very short-lived. So there's a lot of data that you can get from the PROC file system and the uh, Lustre kernel debug logs, but there's a few issues with that. Uh, first, there's some performance problems at scale if you want to gather uh, data from many OSTs on a OSS serving a large number of clients. Uh, in terms of sampling the uh, logs you get from the LCUB DK, uh, you can pollute the logs and uh, if you're sampling them at a regular interval, uh, you might lose some information that's critical for analyzing, say, a uh, crash dump after a crash. But most importantly, we want more information than we can get from the PROC file system. So typically, you might add some new met metrics to Lustre by modifying Lustre itself, build, install, reboot a server. But we don't want to do that. So instead, we use SystemTap to generate new metrics on the fly. Uh, SystemTap provides system-wide tracing capabilities uh, for both kernel and user space, but we've only used it for the kernel so far. Uh, the general process is you write a script in the uh, SystemTap scripting language. Uh, SystemTap translates that into C and loads that into the kernel as a module. And then it has a runtime to facilitate transporting uh, output from the script to user space. Uh, and one way to look at this is uh, if you consider strace, strace allows you to trace a process in the uh, tree of uh, children underneath it. SystemTap provides visibility uh, for uh, not just system calls, but, but calls within the kernel itself across the entire system. Um, using SystemTap with Lustre is pretty easy. Uh, one of the most difficult parts, though, is deciding where to probe for information. Uh, you do need to have some understanding of how Lustre works. Uh, if you look at uh, understanding Lustre file system internals from Oak Ridge and various people formerly from the Sun and now elsewhere, mostly LamCloud, uh, it's a good high-level overview and that plus C-scope and spending some time being around the Lustre source code uh, uh, will help things out. Um, so the typical um, mode of operation is you extract uh, data from kernel uh, function calls as they are called in return. And depending on what you're looking at, uh, you'll either output as you go if you're interested in data on a, uh, say, per RPC basis. Um, or maybe you're going to aggregate the data and periodically display if you're interested in, say, the uh, latency distribution uh, for a particular set of calls uh, inside the Lustre code. Something that makes doing this really easy is the fact that Lustre service threads handle RPCs from start to finish and one at a time. So you're always guaranteed that one service thread is going to handle a single RPC um, before moving on to the next. And so if you're interested in storing uh, timing or other information, you can key that off of the um, the, the PID of the thread. And so here's, uh, this is the only code in the, uh, the presentation. Um, does this have a laser pointer? Yeah. It does. Okay, I'm laser pointer impaired. So I'll just go through this line by line. So uh, system tap will uh, normally infer the type of variables so you don't have to declare them, but with aggregate types you do. So we'll store uh, start times, and then there's uh, the times variable, which will be a uh, statistical aggregate that will let us um, calculate things like a uh, histogram or uh, count min max. Um, the, the next thing that looks like a function call is a probe. And you specify the module in function that you want the probe to fire at and some code uh, to execute when that function is called. So the first one is called when um, the block allocator is invoked. And the second one's called when the block allocator returns. And so when the block, block allocator invoke is invoked, uh, the script will store the current time in milliseconds. When it returns, it'll calculate the delta and uh, store the result in the times aggregate. And if I hit control C to end the script, I'll get a log scale histogram that looks like this. Um, I don't remember the bugzilla I did this work for. Uh, so we we're looking at delays and writes on our system that turned out to be due to very heavy fragmentation on the disk and the way that LDISC FS 
uh, looks for new uh, chunks of free blocks, and also the fact that with OSS read cache turned on, there's a lot of over, over there's a lot of churn in the page cache that will cause the blocks with the block bitmaps and the buddy bitmaps that correspond to them uh, to be discarded and, and necessitate them being reread uh, back into memory. And so the allocation at the bottom took somewhere between uh, 32 and 64 seconds to complete. Uh, so I'm going to go through a few examples um, of tools that we uh, have written in order to address some problems that we have on our production file systems. Uh, the first is addressing uh, poor choice of stripe count. So we decided to make the default stripe size on our file systems one. Now, since most of our files are relatively small, this is usually okay, but there's two big problems that this causes. First, we ask our users to uh, tar up directory structures that they're gonna copy over to our archive system uh, before doing the copy, uh, since our archive system's not gonna deal well with a, a very large number of inodes. Um, if somebody creates a multi-terabyte tar ball, which has happened on multiple occasions, that can take up a significant portion of an OST possibly filling it. Uh, another common problem is if you don't set the stripe size before um, or when you create a file and you have many MPI ranks writing to a single file, that uh, or a, a file on a single stripe, that OST is going to perform very poorly and impact other users. Um, so we wrote a tool to deal with the, the first problem and it's not a, a big stretch to deal with the second one. A tool I'll talk about in a few more slides will address that a little bit. And so what we did was uh, wrote a system path script and a corresponding Python wrapper that hooks into the uh, write path in Luster, uh, I think in particular filter prep RW and filter direct IO, and grabs out uh, various pieces of information that are useful in tracking down the uh, node and process that's writing to a large file. And so I won't run off the list, it's right there. And uh, when a write puts an object over a, uh, or write, when a write occurs to an object that's over a predetermined size, I'll put that information, and then a Python wrapper script will gather some information about the uh, object and the writing process, including the path of the file and the stripe count. And so if I run this, uh, I get some output like this. And so the time of the event, host name, the OST that the large object is on, stripe count of the file, the uh, PID and name of the offending command, the uh, size, which in this case is uh, about uh, 500 megabytes, or excuse me, 500 gigabytes, and the uh, path of the file. And so our, uh, we have a 24-7 um, operations team that can go and look at an OST that's filling up and in real time uh, find out which file and which command, uh, which file is filling up the OST and the host and the command that's uh, filling it up. And so they can go uh, kill the command, move the file, uh, or restrike the file and notify the user. Um, if the command that created the file is not running anymore, you have to resort to some other techniques. Uh, and for us, that's usually running E2 scan uh, to find the large object. And then uh, you can use the uh, debug FS and check command to go and find the corresponding um, mm. I know it on the MBT and, and its path. So another issue that we have to deal with is fragmentation, and uh, in particular two sources. One is on-disk fragmentation. Uh, as I described before, the block allocator uh, sometimes won't find a large enough chunk of contiguous free space, and just the process of finding a uh, chunk of free space can take a long time, and if it results in fragmentation, you have additional IOs for the write itself, and then uh, additional IOs for the read when you read the file back into memory. Uh, another source of fragmentation is an IB SRP driver. I'm not gonna describe this at length. Uh, Dave Dillow gave a talk about this and a solution at the uh, Open Fabric workshops workshop in May, and, or excuse me, March. May's not here yet. And uh, you can go watch it online, but in a nutshell, you can only have uh, 255 lists of pages uh, describing an IO on an OSS that's gonna be sent to an SRP target so if you don't have at least one pair of contiguous pages in memory, you end up with a 1020 plus 4K I.O. Uh, and this will cause performance problems. Uh, we've seen in a recent test about a 30% uh, degradation in performance due to this. And so uh, this tool is not as refined as big object is. It's just raw output from system path. Uh, but what you get is uh, the node that's 
perform in the I.O., the OST, I'll explain why UID and MDT inode are zero in a moment, and the um, size of the I.O. So the first one's going to be a uh, one megabyte or larger I.O. Uh, there's 256 um, entries in that, uh, uh, 256 pages in the I.O. The second one's an example of memory fragmentation um, that's going to cause SRP to issue multiple I.O.s. Uh, so the first I.O. is of size 255 pages, and there's in parentheses the number of hardware descriptors, there's 255, and the second one is uh, just a single page. Um, so we did some maintenance on some of our servers recently. Afterwards, we typically run IOR to ensure that we can get those uh, uh, coveted hero numbers, and typically that's a very good uh, indicator of things going wrong at a high level. Uh, so it, it'll point out IB issues, um, configuration problems, and in this case, uh, one out of eight OSSs for this file system uh, somehow ended up in some pretty severe memory fragmentation that this script showed immediately, and we just rebooted that OSS before it went back into production, uh, and that fixed the issue. Uh, and then the last example here is of uh, on-disk fragmentation. So the first I.O. has uh, six pages in it, and the remaining all have one. Um, and so the, uh, the next step for this is to aggregate this data based on a, uh, or on a per job basis. Uh, so we can go identify codes that are suffering from um, memory fragmentation issues on the OSS and also codes that are suffering from on-disk fragmentation. And we want to go and fix the codes uh, that are causing that on-disk fragmentation due to poor uh, access patterns. Uh, so the last tool I'll talk about uh, helps us identify the source of high OSS load average. We found it's typically due to uh, long disk queues. There certainly are other causes. Um, and the long disk queues are usually caused by many hosts performing IO to a file that's on one or a small number of OSTs. Uh, and again, remember I said that on our file systems we have a default sprite count of one, so this is actually a pretty common problem in our system. And maybe a good reason to uh, change that sprite count to something higher. Now, you can mine the data in PROC to find out the source of the uh, offending I.O. Again, on a large system, this takes time. And beyond that, I'm interested in knowing which file is being accessed. Now, uh, you saw in the, the previous example here, the, uh, for some of these, the MDT, inode, and the UID are zero. There's a, uh, what is it, struct OBDO. In some cases, it looks like it, it doesn't have those fields filled in. And I, it might be on purpose. It, it might not be. Uh, I haven't gone and in, in dug into this too much yet. Uh, but if that data is there, I can identify the, uh, the file being accessed for both reads and writes and, and pin down uh, or drill down to a per file level, which is great to have because now I don't have to go to a, a node that's generating a lot of traffic to a single OST or, or a set of nodes. I can go back to our scientific consulting group and user and say, hey, I owe to this particular file is causing problems. You need to stripe it across uh, multiple OSTs or you need to look at your access patterns to improve them. Um, and so that's really useful versus uh, just giving them a, a job number and a time that a, a problem occurred at. And so the, the output of this command is a, a little icky to read. It's very similar to, to IOSTAT, except uh, I've clipped some columns out so it would fit on the slide, and there's two extra columns on the right-hand side. So there's the, the job number or host uh, that's that generated the highest number of read plus write RPCs during the sampling interval and the, the count and we can update this at a, a very high rate, so uh, typically run it at a, a one second uh, interval. So I'm working through the uh, NASA open source process. I'm hoping to have all the paperwork done after, shortly after I get back, and uh, the distribution will include a few things. First of all, uh, system tap allows you to collect a, uh, a set of aliases for probes and uh, code to extract common data uh, into a library uh, called a tap set. And so there's a tap set that'll, uh, along with some documentation, that will uh, help ease the process of developing uh, tools that use this technique. Um, there's the big object in OST stat utilities, and, and if I uh, finish the wrapper around uh, the fragmentation utility, that as well. And then um, I recently rewrote all these from uh, Perl to Python, first of all, uh, to clean up my code so I won't be too embarrassed when distributing it. Uh, but second, to remove some site-specific issues um, or, or site-specific dependencies, and one of those is the batch system that we use. So there's an easy um, uh, hook that you can use to map host to your site's batch system. Um, I'm really interested in expanding this technique. Um, if you have ideas for tools or problems that you think uh, that can be solved by using this technique, I'm interested in hearing about them. 
Um, and once this is uh, made open source, if we can some patches, that's always appreciated, of course. Uh, and the last thing I want to talk about is visualization. So especially for the, the uh, latency distribution of uh, function call times, um, interested in looking at uh, uh, heat maps of those call times. And so the idea is if you look at a, a hierarchy of calls from top to bottom, uh, visually, it's going to make it easier to pinpoint where in the stack you might be having some performance problems. Now, you, you obviously can't look at uh, latency distributions for uh, all of the calls at, at one time, so you have to be selective in what you display. Um, so it's, it's a bit of an iterative process. Um, and so what I've done over the past few days is, is whipped up a uh, quick demo. Uh, I guess it's somewhere between a mock-up and a prototype. So the, the visualization is live. Uh, the data was uh, collected from a live system that is being played back, again, because I don't trust the wireless network during my talk. Um, and so the uh, I'm showing, I don't remember the exact name of all the calls here. Uh, the luster, the, the names here are actually the names in, that I've, uh, for aliases in the Tapset library, but it's the uh, function that uh, OST handle calls uh, at the very top level of handling a right RPC. Uh, the second one is filter do BIO, and the last one is uh, the same that I showed the script for earlier, uh, the LDISCFS block allocator. And the oranger a square is, the more calls show up in that bin. Uh, there are no labels on the axes yet, but the x-axis is time, and the y-axis is uh, log scale in uh, milliseconds of the uh, latency for um, that particular bin from zero to one up to uh, a second plus. And, uh, I didn't, I didn't try and create a very interesting, well, I tried to create an interesting situation. It didn't create that interesting data. Uh, this is from a relatively idle file system, fired up IOR on uh, 128 ranks, um, pitted against a single OST. And you can see that the writes are pretty slow. Most of them are between uh, a quarter of a second and a second plus. And um, uh, some of those are, the, some of this low performance is a result of the block allocator, so you can see some of the uh, uh, white vertical lines um, in the latency uh, heat map for the block allocator, uh, but not very many of them. Uh, and so you need to go dig a little bit deeper and look at other portions of the uh, right path to understand uh, why the performance is slow, and it may simply be the writes to disk because the queue's overloaded with requests because I'm hitting it from, uh, hitting the disk from so many uh, clients. Um, so that's, this is where I'm trying to make things go. Again, the, the interface is very crude here. I've only been working on this for a few days. Um, and this is largely inspired by some work done by folks at a company called Joyant uh, that are formerly from Sun and Oracle that did a lot of work on uh, Dtrace that are using this to, uh, again, do uh, real-time heat maps of not just latency but some other metrics as well in order to aid in uh, finding and, and fixing performance problems. So a few uh, references, um, um, and of course the slides will be available, uh, so we don't have to write that down. And if you have any questions, um, if there's time now, or find me afterwards, or shoot me an email. Thanks.